Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction and thanks everyone for joining. Um, so today I'm going to give you a little overview about machine learning in drug discovery. Um, while doing the slides, I noticed this is a very large topic, so today it's just early drug discovery. Um, so first of all, who of you has a life science background? Okay, for calibration, who of you has a machine learning background? Okay, good. Um, all right, let's get into it. Um, let me start with a cat. So first of all, this is a machine learning talk, we need a cat. Um, second reason, it's cute. And the third reason, I will explain on the very last slide. So, uh, yeah, keep your attention up for the entire talk. <laughs> um, what can you expect for the next 20-ish minutes? I will give you a little overview about the drug discovery process uh, as it is today and how we want to see it. And then we pick one part of it, which is called lead identification. And then we're going to pick one part of that. Uh, which is morphological profiling, and then in the end we have a short outlook. So, how to find drugs. Um, it's a tedious, long-term process. In the end, we start with finding a target at all. So, which mechanism do we want to uh, target? Let's say a signal protein in a, in a cancer cell, or uh, yeah, some, some other genes in, in, in cardiomyocytes. So first of all, we need to understand how does the disease work and where are angles of attack for potential drug, be it a small molecule or an antibody, doesn't matter. First, we need to find and validate the target. And then a uh, long and tedious filtering uh, process starts, basically starting from tens of thousands or even millions of candidates. Um, filtering out the best, um, and then optimizing from them, um, testing them from all angles with different experiments, with different methods, getting more and more complex, more and more elaborate, uh, until we end up with that one final drug on the market. Um, where do we use machine learning? Along the entire way, even outside of it, uh, in, in uh, HR, in medical affairs, in everywhere. Um, so that's why today we focus on the first part, like finding the needle in the ha haystack. Um, this is what I think is, is the most inter in interesting part, but I'm obviously biased. Uh, so how do we want to see it? Um, internally, we call it going from the champagne flute to the martini glass. So we want to shorten the entire time uh, period, basically half it but also start with a broader range. Um, so not just tens of, tens of thousands or millions of starting points, but billions or even more. So we have a better chance of success and we fail fast. So if you start with tens of millions of compounds, um, you need to get down to your top 10 or top 100 candidates that you put into, let's say, preclinical testing or even clinical testing, you need to get down to this small number very, very fast. And the idea is to do as much, uh, as much experiment as possible in silico, so on the computer, using machine learning and, and data science methods, and only do the expensive experiments in the lab that are run by humans, uh, and only when we are really sure for confirmation. And with this approach, we hope we can um, yeah, m make better decisions and <coughs> Re, uh, reduce the cost drastically, and if you follow the news, we as a company, we really have to cut costs drastically in order to survive, so we have to go all in, all in on this, and um, yeah, I will show you one, one part of it, uh, how we want to tackle this. The first step is lead identification. So once we have a target and know what we want to do with it, our new product, our new drug, finding the, the leads, the candidates. Um, that's basically the entire, the entire goal of lead identification. I mean, it's self-explanatory, right? Um, and yeah, some people also call it screening, but in the end, we want to go to the top 10, top 100, and then from that on, optimize. Not just filter, just op uh, optimize, improve the candidates that we have. Um, this is, mostly uh, a challenge currently of, of data integration. 
So you can run many uh, single experiments, many single models, um, but bringing all this data together is uh, the current challenge. Um, how do we filter? Well, we have a lot of selection criteria. We want to know how well do we bind to the target, how selective is the binding. So we have some t we, uh, frequent hitters. Um, they bind to everything. Um, these kind of molecules we want to filter out. So it has to bind, but it only has to bind to that. Uh, that's a good drug candidate. But then simple things like how, do, how well does it solve in, in water or any other liquid, uh, how well can we synthesize it in the lab, doesn't help if we have a good molecule, but we cannot produce it, right? And then uh, most importantly, the, the admin properties, uh, I will come to that on the next slide. Um, and we have different screening environments. So classical in the lab, high throughput screening, high content screening uh, with images. But what we do now more and more is in silico high throughput screening or virtual screening. So not just testing our compounds with machine learning models, but also that is virtual screening, creating a huge amount of potential theoretical molecules that we have never synthesized, never seen in reality, but we can draw them at least and they make chemically sense. Once we have that, we can put them into the model and um, yeah, screen molecules that we couldn't screen before. And this is one way how we uh, get to this martini glass. And let's talk about admit prediction. This is one of the most critical thing in my opinion um, because we want to know how well does the body ab absorb the molecule how well is it distributed, Doesn't reach the, does it reach the brain, sometimes we want it, sometimes we don't want it, um, how is it metabolized, what does the body do with it, especially the liver, how well does it go out of the body, is it toxic, we don't ob obviously don't want that, and other properties. For that we have a range of uh, wet lab experiments, they take a lot of time, they are expensive, they have a, a low yield rate, um, so Actually, you, when you do millions or thousands of experiments, but in the end you end up with just 10 or 100 molecules, 99% of your experiments are kind of worthless. So this is a very expensive um, process. And what we want to do is, with already existing data, by using similarities, let's say in the chemical space, but also in the morphological space, um, find already some clues how we can rank these compounds. And already by ranking our short list of candidates, um, we can make this whole process much more efficient and get to our top 100 candidates much, much faster. And this is accelerating, but this is also um, decreasing the cost. What we also want to know is why. So explainable AI is also a big topic, especially if you want to gain the trust of traditional wet lab scientists. They want to know why does the model now think this is toxic? Why does the model think um, this, this molecule uh, is well soluble and, and so on? So having methods that can at least point you into the right areas of the, of the molecule really, really helps. Um, but we're not talking only about small molecules. Um, the next big thing are large molecules, um, for example, antibodies, uh, but also un other uh, proteins. So this is, for example, where AlphaFold really came in handy. And um, yeah, in the end, we're doing the same thing. We want to know how stable is that protein. Proteins can be really unstable, but also how human is it. Um, you can always create a protein that binds well to your target, but if you get an allergic reaction because the, your immune system thinks this is not human-like, um, doesn't help. So having simple scoring models is already a good way to, again, rank and, and filter our candidates. But then next step is optimize. Once we have them, how can we make them even more stable or even more human-like? How can we improve this binding? Um, What's, what's the structure? This is, now there's AlphaFold coming in. We can create artificially large amounts of, of amino acid sequences that then fold into a protein, but we need to know how does this folding work. And this is a very, used to be a very expensive, tedious process, but with the introduction of AlphaFold, this is now 
in seconds, and we can do this for any hypothetical uh, protein, and then only synthesize, only predict the structure, or uh, yeah, get the structure for the proteins that we really think are worth going for. And our ultimate goal is de novo design. So without any prior knowledge, just the target structure, what is the best antibody that fits to it and is also very human-like from the beginning. This is really where we want to go. And also here again, uh, we have for many of the antibody experiments, we have uh, yield rates of one in a thousand. So you test thousand proteins, one turns out all right. If we can already make this 10 out of 1,000, this is 10 times increased, then we can focus our energies on either testing smaller amounts, but on more targets or anything else. So any bit of uh, efficiency increase um, helps a lot here, and this is what we're going for. So I've already said um, we can uh, we can look at morphological similarity. So what do I mean by that? So morphological profiling is now one method within uh, lead identification or lead uh, discovery um, that gives you more information. And this is also, again, a very tedious process. Uh, and this is where machine learning comes in really, really handy. Um, how do we do this? Um, there is an essay called cell painting um, where you try to highlight as many structures as possible in the cells. So usually if you look through the microscope, cell is transparent, you don't see anything. So putting certain uh, stains that adhere to certain structures makes things visible and we try to make as many structures visible as possible and then um, create a feature vector out of it. Um, traditionally, you would do a very specific image analysis to measure only what you want to see, having, let's say, a single readout of how large is the, uh, the nucleus or how many cells do I have in the end. Um, very simple readout that you use for one specific purpose. We want to go away from that and create uh, information-rich uh, embedding so that we can test like 50,000, 100,000 different conditions and then uh, compare the, the similarity between them. And we need to do this in an automated way because um, we don't even have time to do the, the microscope or the microscopy images ourselves. We don't have time to look at them ourselves. Um, so we have to keep up with the robots. And this is only, uh, the, the only machine learning can help. So how do we do this? Um, we have a lot of data. We have millions of images, uh, I would say billions of images. But the problem is we don't have any annotations. So um, as the title suggests, we cannot do supervised learning. We cannot do like um, find all the cats or all the dogs in the image. We, we don't know what's in the image. We just see uh, random cancer cells and they change their shape, their color, whatever. But we don't know if is this an effect or not. So from these 50,000 to 100,000 uh, conditions that we produce by putting molecules on them, 90 to 95% don't do any effect at all. So we cannot do supervised learning. So self-supervised learning it is. Um, we currently use uh, the Dino framework and training a small vision transformer in a self-supervised way. Um, so in the end, we get a feature vector, an embedding that describes what's in the image, right? Um, similar to, to, to text or to natural images. And the idea is then once we have these embeddings, we can cluster them, we can produce similarity maps. And by having some certain landmarks where we know for sure what's happening, let's say we have 1,000 gene knockdowns um, where we turn on, off, turn on and off single genes, compare that to our 50,000 compounds. But once we see compounds clustering around one gene knockout, we know, ah, OK, these compounds, they have to do something with that signaling pathway. So this is how we can, in an explorative, uh, explorative way, get knowledge um, without relying on any annotations except our few landmarks. And the cool thing about it, because these embeddings are so versatile, so universal, and not purpose or, or, or target-driven, they're just 
capturing the information of the image, we can keep them in a database and reuse them all the time. So with every experiment, our uh, vector database is growing and growing and growing. We get more and more reference points, more and more landmarks. Um, so you actually get a nonlinear value, right? Because every experiment benefits from the previous one. So it's, it's a really cool thing. I really like it. Uh, and how it looks like. Um, so here we see a UMAP of, uh, I don't know, I, I think 1,000 genes turned randomly on and off. And what we see is that certain gene families uh, cluster together. So remember, we didn't put any information about uh, uh, biology or labels into the model. We just gave it the images, forced it to abstract the information in it. And using a simple UMAP, we can identify some clusters. You can also see there's a huge cluster that does nothing. Um, but uh, coloring afterwards with the information that we have, we see, OK, it's, it's learning something biological relevant. Now we can put in our compounds that we don't know anything about. And when I want to say, let's say I want to find a KRAS inhibitor, I just see, uh, OK, which compounds cluster around my light blue cluster. And then I have my leads. And the thing is, it's a very tedious uh, analysis process. Um, it wasn't machine learning driven before. We used cell profiler that was state of the art in the industry. And um, that's a very traditional brute force feature extraction method. Um, and we didn't have any streamlined processes for it. We handled CSV tables. Data exploration was done in Jupyter notebooks. And we're a big German company. We exchange data via SharePoint. Um, you see, this is not sustainable. So what we're doing right now is streamlining this entire workflow. Um, really, the scientists, they can do their experiments on the, on the microscope. They can go to the computer, import the data directly, get a coffee, or have lunch, to be realistic, and then see already their scatter plot in the browser. And Already that helps a lot, ironing out all the errors. But by replacing cell profiler with a machine learning model, um, the self-supervised uh, model, we can even accelerate this, uh, uh, this, this process by factor 50 and decrease the cost by factor 50. So instead of one week waiting for the images to be processed, it's just a few hours. So this is really, really helpful. And what we do then? We put it in a nice dashboard uh, where you can trigger the data, browse the data, explore it, um, do anything you want. Um, you can clearly see now the big cluster of negatives, then smaller cluster that do something. Most of them are artifacts to be realistic, but some of them actually have a meaning. Um, I cannot show you the meaning, of, obviously. Um, and soon you can also pick some models, so currently we just have one model, but you can pick different generations of models from weights and biases, of course, and then uh, we compute this with different embeddings. And of course, we're machine learners, we need a dark mode. Um, so let me wrap up things, uh, things up with the little outlook. This is a very opinionated, uh, subjective outlook into the future. Um, how do we get more and more to this martini glass? So first of all, Gen AI, right? Um, it was said in a, in a keynote before, just by making the, the office uh, workflows more efficient, uh, creating outlines for, for, for talks, summarizing meetings, I'm really looking forward to that. Um, helping with coding Copilot, real, real help. Um, yeah, this is helping us immediately, right? Um, since we're in London, are people from isomorphic labs here? Anyway, Alpha 3. While I was preparing the slides, they released Alpha 3. This is a huge breakthrough. This will have a huge impact on decreasing the cycle times again, giving us more accurate uh, structures. Um, then we also need our own foundation models, not just for languages, but for medical images. Uh, there's a medical segment anything, but also large language models for DNA, for antibodies, for RNA. That's what we need. And then the next big thing, Everyone talks about a digital twins, right? We need a virtual representation of the patients that we want to treat. 
but we also need virtual representations of animals because currently we have to do animal testing. Animal testing sucks and having like a digital twin could reduce this dramatically. And then my goal is that in a few years we don't do any animal testing anymore and the only way we use animals is in PowerPoint slides. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs>